In Galarians, there are memos and diaries to find, but most mysteries are pieced together through the use of your protagonist's psychic powers. Amnesiac Rion can scan his surroundings and receive visions of related past events. Or if it's a door, maybe a vague image of where the key might be. This helps this PS1 horror game overcome one contrivance a lot of survival horror titles suffer from. Here, random civilians needn't keep dropping their cryptic diaries all over the level to give you clues, or to fill you in on events you missed before your character got there. Rion can receive information on events nobody would have been there to record or recount, thanks to an in-universe explanation. Exploring the world of Galarians using this psychic scan command to see what might trigger a vision makes for a rewarding exploration. Entirely missable FMV cutscenes can occur sometimes. With this novel mechanic thrown into a mix of survival mechanics, dark oppressive environments, and maze-like levels, you'd think you'd be in for a classic survival horror adventure. Yeah, all the ingredients are there, but it's a little hard to feel like you're the one experiencing the survival and the horror when enemies react to you like this. No! Rehab! No! no! Help! Here, you're the lab experiment on the loose, not the guy running from it. Scientists and security guards with batons are initially all that stand in your way as you try to escape the lab you wake up in at the start, and there's not much they can do. It's a brutal twist on the formula, as enemies aren't zombies that fall to the ground and disappear into mush. Instead, take out one person, and another may rush over to try and perform CPR. Oh. By injecting himself with various chemicals, Rion can send out psychic blasts, and even more brutally, set enemies on fire. And if that wasn't enough, there's shorting. Ah! As time passes, Rion will eventually get a killer migraine. And when a psychic gets a migraine, you don't want to be around them. It's over in the worst way possible for anyone nearby. The threats in the first level escalate as you would expect them to. At first, it's just those scientists and baton-wielding guards trying to corral you. But as you explore and backtrack on yourself, military personnel with assault rifles will start hiding around corners, with big hulking tank suits becoming the final line of defense. The interior of this hospital is cramped and claustrophobic, but the tension is released a little if you step out onto this balcony and get to appreciate how all this chaos is happening right under the nose of a large, oblivious urban population. What follows is an adventure into a grimy, dark world. What was I doing there? My mind was all cloudy, and I couldn't remember a thing. I was all alone. From here on out, weird G-men-looking goons will be hunting you, as well as other psychics, the titular Galarians, tasked with cutting you down to size. An abandoned mansion contains dark secrets of the past, and dodgy guests conduct suspicious business out of a scuzzy hotel. Don't mess with me, kid. I can't stand the sight of you. I shall pray for your soul. Please, the donation. I need the donation. Where is the money? It's the 26th century, but there's a retro-futuristic aesthetic going on. The larger world here has a round, over-designed look, from its cars, to its trams, to its architecture. That round bounciness to everything that implies an optimism for the future upon design and construction that has now been lost to time, now corrupted by dirt and rust spreading across it all. A lack of care exposing the brown, soulless metal lying underneath making it evident that the prosperous, hopeful era of this world has come and gone by this point. An exception to this rotting, retro-future world is, ironically, the Mad Science Lab. It's a rectangular, sleek, clean, modern light building slapped into the middle of the city, indifferent to the decaying society around it. The game maintains this thick mood throughout, but alongside good variety. There's the steely indifference of the lab hospital, the washed-out, almost sepia-brown stillness of the mansion, brings to mind the kind of old forgotten dusty rooms that once played host to warmth and smiles a long time ago. There's a mid-century decor here that suggests a vibrancy that has now decayed and withered away. 
the suffocating exposed metal of the hotel, somewhere that's supposed to be a place of rest and comfort, paints the picture of a world in which such luxuries are a distant thought. All of this is brought to life with pre-rendered backgrounds that allow the now ancient hardware to put on display the type of detailed clutter that would no doubt be strewn about a neglected world like this. I also just want to compliment this game's environments for how many bathrooms there are for a 90s horror game. There's a real believable amount compared to, say, Resident Evil's one per game. I won't show the final areas in this video, but it's safe to say they are some of the most nightmarish in design. Science corrupting the world and turning it into a true futuristic hell. Much like how the events of the game take place in the background, underneath a large population, the soundtrack is understated. Yet grungy and industrial. When the tempo increases ever so slightly, you can feel the foundations of this world start to buckle just a little bit as the psychics ramp up for a tense battle. <laughs> I think I'm gonna short circuit. I've never enjoyed anything this much. <laughs> While the hotel has quite a boring floor plan, being a bunch of rooms and halls laid out on a grid, the eccentric guests you run across do a good job at giving you this glimpse into the wider world of Galarians, seeing just how far gone people potentially are. Each one decorates their room in profoundly unhinged ways, like the pill pusher here whose room is plastered in smut mags, or the religious zealot who, well, you tell me what's going on here. The game is replete with weird off-kilter touches. Check out the mad scientist character who has a third boot on his walking stick. Or how the dealer's lair is laughably conspicuous in how it's locked down. <laughs> no suspicious activity going on here, sir. Rion, this lab monster, fueling his gruesome powers by pill-popping and injecting himself with different substances, feels like the walking culmination of this gross world's achievements. A lost, aimless soul self-medicating to prolong a survival wrought with pain that spreads destruction. Performances aren't the worst you could stumble across at the time, but the voice direction has certainly turned out some often flat results here. Mother told me that moment of shorting feels oh so good. Rita, you've gone insane. It released in 99 in Japan, but came out in 2000 in the West. Rion, such strength! And even by that point, people were expecting a little more to be put into this aspect of things. Don't worry about me. I don't like myself anyway. However, the FMVs those performances are in do a good job at visually showing the character's emotions, which is kind of the point of having them in these titles with such primitive in-game 3D models. Plus, they let the player see some of the macabre imagery in more detail, much to the benefit of the final chapter especially. Again, there are some wild things here in the finale I don't want to show that Hellish doesn't even begin to describe. Sometimes you come across a game where it's clear it was never destined for mainstream recognition. So you're telling me the game is set in 2500 and it's about a teenager who goes around shooting up so he can horribly maim people with his mind? <laughs> Get this man the Jumbotron. What the hell? It wasn't going to happen. But another reason this game's appeal might be limited is that this isn't like a Silent Hill that doesn't crank the challenge too high, so less skilled players can still make it through and soak up the mood and story. This is a hard little game where you might feel like a creature on the loose when winning, but failure is soundly punished. Fighting has you locking onto enemies while stationary and firing away, except to get the most out of your attacks, you'll want to charge them. This offers the combat a good risk-reward feel, where you have to gauge how long you have before an enemy gets over to you, and if you have time to make it to a full charge. All your attacks have finite energy too that you'll want to conserve, so knowing when to run and when to fight is important. Then there's skips. These rare pills upgrade your psychic attacks. The upgrade though will be revoked if your health drops below half. So it presents a tough but interesting choice. A single healing pill will refill your entire health bar. So are you willing to partially waste one on a half fill 
to preserve these upgrades. What about shorting? Well, that's gonna happen at some point no matter what you do. The migraine meter charges on its own, and when it reaches max, the next time you try and use your powers again, the short will trigger. Some attacks from enemies will kick it up higher too, but what seems to have the most effect on it speeding up is how much you're attacking, how much psychic attack goo you're expending. Rion can only walk in this state, and his health will constantly deplete until it's game over. So it's largely a curse more than it is a gift. To go back to normal, you need to take a painkiller, and if you don't have one, you have to hope you have enough health reserves until you can. Planning ahead and maybe letting the short trigger when you have the meds to undo it quickly, though, is something to keep in mind. <laughs> Hold on a second, back it up, you might be saying. So what you're telling me is that this is a game where a bar to your death is constantly ticking up, and if you don't have a consumable item, of which there are a finite amount in the game, you are doomed and potentially stuck without further recourse. Yeah, that, and you have limited inventory space for pills, so you often can't even pick up a lot of what you find without using up other resources, like your mind ammo and health items. If all you're used to are modern games, where you follow waypoints and fill out checklists of objectives you can complete at a leisurely pace, then you might be on the verge of having a short of your own right now, hearing about this. But, uh, yeah, I will admit, you have to be on your toes in this one. Run out of vials to fuel your attacks, and there's no way to attack and progress the story. Run out of pills and the next short will end your game. There's only a limited supply of these resources hidden around the game, and it's totally possible to ruin your save file and make the game unbeatable, far more easily than in classic Resident Evil, which at bare minimum has an unbreakable melee weapon and doesn't have a ticking time bomb about to go off the whole game. Now here you can save as much as you want. Saving isn't an expendable resource like in classic Resident Evil, but you are only getting three slots per memory card here. Whatever your circumstance, you want to back up as many saves as possible, in case you get into a no-win situation and need to rewind the clock a bit. Puzzles aren't as demanding as Resident Evil or Silent Hill, but there's a lower margin for error when it comes to mismanaging resources, or wasting them on botched fights. Points of no return mean that resources left behind stay behind too. The original Resident Evils rarely, if ever, forced you into fights outside of bosses, but towards the end Galarian starts resorting to this quite a bit. I don't think there's enough tools or moves on offer here to turn the game into such a concentrated onslaught of obligatory fights, especially when some of these fights are in cramped spaces with multiple foes. The lack of any defensive options can make these more frustrating than tense. Sometimes the game lets you retarget mid-charge, and sometimes it seems reticent to let you do so. One boss fight in particular has such a small window where it can take damage. Timing that can be hard when the arena only has two camera angles. Not very good, and really not very good. Yes, if I was in charge, I probably would have contrived in some universal inventory system to store resources in for later, and maybe I would have made shorting handle differently so as to have its downsides, but not to be such a death sentence. It's good here that shorting has downsides. After all, the damage it can do to Rion is what makes, say, running in a circle to trigger it for every fight unviable. Maybe it could have reduced the player's health without killing them, though. The fact that it doesn't have any effect on Galarians is important to turn them into threatening bosses, but maybe it could have at least done a little damage to them in some capacity. For those experienced with survival horror games from this era, how unforgiving the systems of Galarians are and their rough edges, I don't think will prevent you from enjoying this novel take on the formula. It's well crafted enough and clever enough to win over someone with the right experience, and some of the harsh penalties may get you thinking in new ways. Compelling to the connoisseur of this era's horror titles, perhaps, but for more modern gamers not used to 90s horror gaming, this is one I can see crossing over into frustrating. Even for those who have maybe beaten something like Silent Hill 1, or just about made it through a classic resi. Die. If the mere idea of being able to stumble your way into an unbeatable save file seems like an inconceivable situation for a game to make possible, then I could certainly see you quitting in a game where you can also hear the lock click behind you and get jumped in a tiny hotel room. Still, whoever you are, if you do plan on playing, let me give you some tips. First, an actual bullshit moment. If you want to get over this hole, and you'll have to, you need to mash X to make Rion climb up and not fall. 
The game doesn't tell you this, it's sort of uh, an invisible quick time event, and it sucks. Always interact a few extra times with things. One click is often not enough to get the full interaction. And even more than one item can be stacked on top of each other sometimes, so it's good to double check even if you do find something. If it isn't obvious, you won't be given indication as to where consumables are in the level, you have to go around hitting X to try your luck. Look in any corners or near desks and beds. Anywhere that looks busy could hide something that will mean victory in a later battle. You know, feel it out. Be your own, psychic. Once you find the third power, D. Fallon, don't waste a drop on any fight that's not mandatory. It will serve you well in the endgame. This next one I can't really help you with, as much as I can just encourage you to persevere. This is one of the most infamous parts of the game. Rion vs. Door. So you run into this guy that tells you that to get into the D-Dealer's room, you have to do a special knock. Knock like this to get in. How's he making that sound on his own? Anyway, you have to replicate the knock almost exactly. There's only a few frames of grace per knock. It's like a Virtua Fighter combo or something. You might get lucky or you might spend quite some time here. Come on in. I encourage you to check out a video, I'll link down below, where someone broke this puzzle down on an emulator to get an idea of what's going on under the hood, and it really makes you wonder why they made it the way they did. The overall story and finale of Galarians is good enough to persevere through some poor moments. I don't want to go into it too much, but there's plenty of things to mull over by the end. Themes of identity, free will, and God. It's not all communicated and presented as well as it could be. I don't like myself anyway. But combine it all with the thick atmosphere and creative world, and you have the kind of cult game that makes up for its shortcomings with how impressively it tries to punch above its weight class. Keep in mind, this is a grim game. There's a lot of suffering. But without spoiling anything, I don't think misery is the only thing it leaves with you to reflect on. It's not just pure misery porn. This is only a four to five hour game with no ranks or much in the way of extra unlockables, unfortunately. There is a new game plus mode with a few differences though, and it's one of those alluring worlds that you'll want to jump into again at some point to replay, if only to soak it all in again and catch details you maybe didn't before, which there will probably be plenty of. Don't believe the US box that claims there's 50 hours of gameplay. Where did that extra zero come from? Man, they were really stuck at the knocking puzzle, weren't they? Maybe this was a typo and they meant five hours, though even for the time that wasn't really something anyone would brag about. I mean, I suppose any game has 50 hours of gameplay if you just stand around in enough rooms long enough. I will mention there is a sequel for the PS2, Galarian's Ash. Now don't get me wrong, there is a lot I could say about this game. Touch the screen you're playing this video on all you want with your psychic hand. No vision will prepare you for where this series decides to go. It has a totally different setting, totally different gameplay, and totally different feel and it has a lot of issues. I don't really want to get into it in this video and distract from the original by having to go into a very different kind of game, as well as just having to give away elements of the first game by even telling you the premise of its sequel. I'll let Galarian's one sit with you guys for a bit and maybe cover the sequel at a future date, when at least, you know, five of you have had the chance to give the original a try. I think it's well worth a playthrough for survival horror fans prepared for some challenge. If you're not too clued up on these kind of games or you're used to more modern ones, it might be a little frustrating. But even then, the world and story here may just be enough to allow even a casual player to persevere. It's a far cut above a lot of niche horror games released in the late 90s to early 2000s that people will recommend for ambience or weird plot. <laughs> and that it's actually pretty good. We can nitpick the implementation for sure, but the psychic combat and short system is a creative twist on things that demands strategy from the player and feels rewarding when you get it right. In other ways, you might consider the game more user-friendly than some of the great survival horror games of the time, like how quickly you can get into your inventory or look at your map here, both without having to go to a separate screen. Interacting with the world and making discoveries about it via your psychic scan is a cool novelty. Rewarding curiosity on the player's part while offering an alternative to logs and diaries that can get across more information in a more efficient way, as well as an appropriately creepy fashion. The art direction is also a cut above many others in the genre, at times wild, but still conveying a cohesive world. A world where it takes a monster to survive, but far more than that, to thrive.